Brother, we're going to be continuing our study here in Acts chapter 2. And just by quick way of reminder, I'm not going to ask you, but we talked about two uh, points or two aspects of what I'm calling here a fourfold chord. And that's, that's playing off of that text there in Ecclesiastes where uh, a three-strand cord is not easily broken. And brethren, I talked about the other week here that, that what we see here is, is, is these four things that the church is devoting themselves to, that the church is giving themselves to. And brethren, my, my, my heart's desire here is that we would be a strong church. That we'd be a strong people. Not because uh, we want to be strong in the world's eyes, but brethren, that we would be strong because we look to Christ. That we look to one another because we are weak. We devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. We devote ourselves to the Word of God. Because we are weak, we devote ourselves to one another in the fellowship. And in that, brethren, we'd be strong. That we would be a strong people walking in the strength of the Lord. That's my desire last week. That's my desire this week. That's what I'm aiming at here, brethren. Strength and life. Talked about this, that, that, that life is pouring forth from these brethren here in the early church. And we see all the fruit that was, that was coming upon them. I mean, there, there's joy. They're sharing their resources together. They are praising God together. And God is blessing them. God is blessing this kind of Christianity day by day. The Lord is adding to these people as they are devoted. Brethren, they're devoted. And I want to see our church this way. I want to see us growing in here. Remember, I talked about this last, or the last time I preached. I want to see us grow. We all have room to grow. And, and you know what? I have been so encouraged uh, this week just, just, just looking at the Word, uh, talking about uh, what we're going to talk about today. I've been, I've been encouraged. But brethren, I want to see us as a church living with conviction. I want to see us as a church who, who our, our aim is to please Christ. It's to please Him, brethren, to have a zeal for Him, to have a zeal for the nations, to have a zeal for one another, to have a zeal to see the church built up and edified, to grow in love for one another, that we would be more of a united front, bound by the Spirit of God, serving the Lord side by side. I want to see that in us. and I want to see that growing in us. Now, last week, I had asked you what the word devoted had meant. And we had talked about that, uh, remember, uh, a steadfastness, a resolve. Uh, remember, sister, you had said, with, with all your heart, you're, we're, we're devoted. And we see the early church here devoted. And it's instructive for us in the Christian life. But I want to ask you this week, not what devoted means, and this is not rhetorical, you can shout some things out. Brethren, what's the opposite of being devoted? What's the opposite? Unfaithful. Unfaithful okay, what, what else? Lazy. Lazy. Okay, what else? If you're not devoted, what's the opposite of that? Undevoted. undevoted. Praise the Lord. <laughs> yes, undevoted. What's that? Neglectful. Neglectful. Yes. Right? What else? Lackadaisical. Procrastination. What, what do you got? Huh? Aloof. Yeah, that's a good word. Yep. Some of you are going to be Googling, what does aloof mean? <laughs> You're already on it, Louise. Good for you. <laughs> yeah, so let me hear these words, brother, because, you know, th these are kind of strong, and I, and, and, and I want this to, to come off a little strong. I don't want to come off strong, but I want the words to come off strong. The opposite of devoted, idle, indifferent, unmoved, unconcerned. Cold, uninterested, slothful, absent. That's the opposite of devoted. Brother, may it not be said of us. May it not be said that we are people who are unconcerned, indifferent, unmotivated, cold, uninterested. Brother, that's the opposite of devoted. But here we see that these are people, they are devoted, they have people with conviction. It's like what Paul says in Romans chapter 12, do not be slothful in zeal. Be fervent in spirit and serve the Lord. Brethren, there must be no hesitation. There must be no sloth in the Christian life. We ought to be a people who are living with, with, or, or for Christ with enthusiasm, with some zeal, with some passion for Christ, with energy, 
with conviction to these, to these four things. And yes, many other things as well. This is not encompassing all that the Bible talks about, about being devoted. You can do a concordant search of what the Scriptures say to be devoted, and there's other things about to be devoted to. But brethren, these things are the foundation. We need to be a people uh, conv with, with, with conviction walking in these things because you know what flows out of this church? Life. Life. Life is found here in these pages. Life is found among these brethren. And I want us to grow in this. These things are vital. These things are essential for us, church. These things are imperative for us. That we would be devoted to the apostles' teaching, the Word of God. We'd be devoted to the fellowship. And I kind of made some clarifications here uh, uh, in the Bible study on Friday about, uh, about what this means. It doesn't just mean hanging around and having kumbaya. It means that we are devoted to one another. We are, we are in the fellowship of one another. There's community. There's a bond here. We are looking out for one another. We are, we are exhorting one another. There's a commitment here to one another. It's not just getting together to play you know, cards or fun games or, 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 or what have you, going out and doing fun things together. That's true. That's there. But it's more than just that. We talked about a little bit of that on Friday. So what we're going to do today, brethren, is we're going to look at this third thing here, that the, the, the brethren here, the church, is devoted to the breaking of bread. And... We're only going to do one this morning uh, because I was talking to Nick earlier before the sermon. I, I just refuse to just tack on prayer at the end and not give it a full study because I have a, I have a lot here to talk about. Maybe not too much, but, but as I started looking at the importance of, of, of what it means theologically for us to be a people who are breaking bread together, I didn't want to just tack on prayer at the end. And I didn't want to preach for an hour and a half either. But... Uh, that might happen regardless, but uh, I didn't. So I want to give I want to give uh, you know prayer a a fuller look, and so we're going to do that next time. Uh, but I want to I want to just give our attention here today to what the scriptures say that they devoted themselves to the breaking of bread. Now listen, right up front, brethren. I think this is a reference to the fellowship meals, to the love feasts to the brethren eating together. Because of the context here, if you just look down in, in, in verse 2, or I'm sorry, chapter 2, verse 46, it says, "...and day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts." So I think what's going on here is that we're talking about fellowship meals, we're talking about getting together around a table and, and eating with one another. Now, 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 now certainly, this, this, this does entail the Lord's Supper, and, and that is an aspect of the breaking bread together. But my focus this morning is not going to be so much on the Lord's Supper. I'm going to talk about a little bit of that as we go along. And that's here, brethren. It's here where we get together in the fellowship meal to also eat. And then we break bread together in the Lord's Supper. We do that every week, do we not? Okay. So this is there. But my, but my, my, my emphasis this morning is going to be around us sitting around a table together and eating. Okay? And my desire this morning is this. I want you to be stirred up, brethren. I want you to be stirred up to have a greater view and a greater picture and a greater understanding of what we're doing in the fellowship meal every, every week after the preaching is over with. That I want you to see that in a greater light with what the Scriptures have to say. I want you to also be stirred up to this, brethren, for you to eat with one another. For you to eat with one another for us as a church to grow in inviting the brethren into our homes to spread a meal before them. I want us to grow in that. And we have room to grow in that. All of us do. To eat with one another. To bring the brethren into the home. And this is really the context. Remember we talked about doing these pastoral visits. Now listen, most of the time in uh, what you know, how I've understood pastoral visits is, you know, the pastor comes to your house, you know, we sit on the couch, and we just talk about, you know, what's going on in your life, and we shepherd you, and that's what we want to do. We talked about that maybe a couple months ago, and we, start to, so we started to do that. But we've kind of done our own little, little twist on things, is we've typically invited you into our homes to break bread together, to have a meal together, to eat with one another. And there's a reason for that, brethren. It's not just something that we just do arbitrarily. We want, to, we want to come, we want to share a meal, we want to shepherd you and, 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 and encourage you, but not just us to you, we want to see that growing with you with, with one another. 
And I know that some of you uh, are doing that and that's encouraging and I want to stir you up to continue to do that and to grow in that as we eat together with one another. And brethren, like I said before, listen, I've been really encouraged in the Word uh, this week. I needed this. I needed the Word. I needed to study this, to be encouraged and stirred up in this. And I, I, I've been praying, brethren, that it would be an encouragement to you uh, this morning. I hope it's, it's, it's good for you as well as it has been good for me. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why are they devoted to the breaking of bread? Why are the brethren here devoted to eating with one another? Why are they devoted to feasting together? Why not something else? Why are they eating and not doing something else? Why, why is it eating? Why are they devoted to the breaking of bread with one another, going home to home, receiving their food with glad and generous hearts? Why eating? What's the big deal about eating? I mean, could, could a fellowship meal be that important? Is it, is it that big of a deal to get around the table and eat together? Why, why is this important? I mean, is this to be the highlight of the gathered people of God? When, when, when brethren, when, when, uh, when we have guests that, 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 that come here and they don't stay for the fellowship meal, do we, do we think they're missing out on something? Right? Okay, we do, but I want to ask the question, why? What are they missing out on? What, what is so special about people eating together? Right? Because I grew up in churches that they always said, oh, we just love to eat together. That's what we do. We're Baptists. We eat. Well, why? For, for what, what's the point of that? Why, why are we eating? Just because? We just like food? Just, what's the big deal? You know what I mean? Like, why, why, why are these people gathered together around the table to eat? What is the significance of that? I want to show you something here uh, in the book of Acts that I find to be uh, very fascinating here. Go to Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. And here we have in the first couple of verses, Paul is uh, going all over the place with Luke here. And they're visiting these different areas, encouraging the brethren. You've got a long list of names here that I'm not going to read. Uh, and then at the end of verse 6 here, uh, it says, But we sailed away, this is Acts 20, We sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. So here are the brethren, here's Paul, here's Luke and the brethren, and they're in Troas for this extended time, for seven days. Now, now look at verse 7. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. Now stop a second. Stop. Did you catch what Luke says here in, in verse 7? On the first day of the week, brethren, that's, that, that, that's Sunday, that's, that, that's today. On the first day of the week, when we were gathered together to break bread. Brethren, the whole purpose of the gathering on the first day of the week is not to hear the preaching. It's not, uh, Luke says here, to, to, to sing together, though those things are very important. They gathered together to break bread with one another. They gathered. Brethren, that is the purpose of their gathering. Do we think of the fellowship meal that way? We meet on Sunday we were gathered together to break bread. This is, this is the purpose of the meeting. It's the highlight. It's, it's, it's the climax. Is to eat together. This is fascinating to think about. Now, of course, yes, as Paul preached, of course he brings the word. Do they sing songs? Yeah, probably do. They probably sing to one another. But I find it very interesting that, that, that the emphasis here is that on the first day of the week when we had gathered together to break bread, that was the climax of their meeting together. Everything built up to that. To gather around and eat with one another. And again, you go to verse 11. It says, when Paul, and this is after he was talking for a long time, and young man fell out of the window. And verse 11, and when Paul had gone up and had broken the bread and eaten, he conversed with them for a long while until daybreak and so departed. I mean, they're together all night. They're eating together. They're in the Word it's like he prolonged his speech and then they were, t they were this is an all-nighter. I, I don't know what they do with their kids, just sleeping, I guess. But, you know, they are together and they've met 
for breaking bread with one another. Fascinating, brethren. Fascinating. What is it about us that loves feasting? Why is that? You ever ask yourself that question? Why is that, brethren? Do we love feasting? Why do families gather around a table uh, for holidays, you know, uh, Christmas and uh, you know, Easter or whatever, and, 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 and Thanksgiving? Why is that important? Why do we have a big, large spread on these kind of holidays, something really special? Why does our church have this big feast on the holidays? Why, why is it, brethren? Why do we have a nice feast at weddings? Ever ask yourself that question? What's the emphasis on that? And that's an important part. If you're going to get married, you've got to have some good food, right? And, and, and sometimes too much emphasis on the food. Like why is that? Why, why is that so special? What is it about eating? Why, you know, when I was growing up, we had uh, like Sunday night family dinners, and my mom did that for a long time. Uh, and it was just this, this, this weekly thing when the family gathered, and my mom always put on a good spread uh, on Sunday nights. Why do people go out for dinners on their birthdays and anniversaries? Why is that a thing? Why is that so important? Brother, you had, you know, your mom's birthday party last night, uh, and I'm sure there was a lot of food there. Was there? Oh, yeah, big feast. You guys ate. You know, why is that? Why, why, why do we do these kinds of things? What, what makes for the occasion to call for feasting? And, brother, why does God's judgment often consist of stopping festivity? That's what we read in Isaiah 24. When the judgment of God came, the festivity ceased. There was no more singing for joy, no more wine, no more nothing. The festivity stopped as the judgment of God was poured out. Brethren, why do we find it a tragedy when families do not sit around the table anymore in our generation? You guys have heard this before. Two, mom, uh, two parents are out working, kids are just doing whatever they want. Families hardly ever in the world gather around the table together anymore. Why do we find that to be a tragedy? Why is that not encouraging? Brethren, why do we get so upset when governments shut down restaurants so that there is no more eating together? Why do we find it infuriating when, when, when tyrants try to tell us you cannot feast anymore for Thanksgiving with your family? You cannot get together anymore for Christmas dinners. And if you're going to, keep it really small. Don't have a large gathering. Don't, don't have a big feast anymore. Shut it down. Why does that infuriate people, brethren? No more feasting. No more Christmas meals. No more Thanksgiving. Just, just keep it low key this year. Keep it small. Why is that devastating, brethren? Because we're made in God's image. And God is a God of feasting and festivity. we got to see that in the Scriptures. God is a God of feasting. That's why we love to eat. That's why we love to gather around with the brethren. That's why. And sometimes it's broken, right? Sometimes it's not, you know, uh, there's feasts for the wrong reasons. But brethren, we're made in God's image. And God is a God of festivity. He's the God who says, come to the table. And we see this all over. The, brother, this is all over the Bible. When you get in the Scriptures and you see the, the, the feasting imagery in the Bible, it is dense. It is all over the place. Feasting together as the people of God, brethren, is a taste of the kingdom here on earth. Pun intended. It's a taste of the kingdom right here on earth, brethren. Listen to this. What is the kingdom of God compared to? Well, yeah, a lot of things. That's good. Okay, but in the context of the sermon, what's the, what's the, what's the kingdom of God compared to? Brethren, it's a, a banquet, a wedding feast. We see that there. We read about it a little bit in Luke 14. you got Matthew's version over there in, 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 in Matthew 21. The kingdom of God is like a, it's like a wedding banquet. The marriage supper of the Lamb. This feast this, for, that this king gives for his son, and he invites all peoples to come. He invites the Jews, but, but the elite Jews say, no, we don't want to come to that. Okay, we'll go back out, like, like Michael read in Luke 14. And you invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. You bring them in. Okay, they've come, and there's still room. Oh, brethren, there's a lot of room in God's house to feast with him. It's okay, you go out and you go get the Gentiles. You go out to the highways and the byways and you compel them to come in. Why? That my house may be filled. 
Not one empty seat, brethren, in this dinner feast that the Lord gives to us. The, the kingdom of God, brethren, it is compared to a feast. You get this in Matthew chapter 8 where Jesus says that many will come. You can, I mean, you can go there if you want. Many will come from east and west, right? To recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of God. Now, recline at table. Brother, what are they doing around the table? I mean, they're not playing chess, right? Maybe, all right? But probably not, <laughs> right? They're not, right? What are they doing around the table, brethren? They've come to eat, you dine at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That, that's the imagery. That's the picture of the kingdom of God coming and gathering with the brethren, sitting around a table, enjoying a meal together. That's the imagery. Now listen. God prepares the table. He's the God of feasting. And He is the host. I want to encourage you this way. Listen, I want to try to lay out before you what God does for you and me in this eating imagery, and then I want you to see that, and I want you to go, oh yes, he does that for me. I then want to outflow that to the brethren. And that's how I want to encourage you today. I want to show you that God is the host. And then in turn, we go out and we host one another. That's, that's what I'm trying to lay out here. So first of all here, God prepares the table. He's the God of feasting. Now I'm going to just tell you some verses here and then we're going to go to other verses here. I want to show you examples of God spreading a table for His people. We get this first in Exodus chapter... You don't need to go there. Exodus 23 verse 14. When God tells the people, you are to appear before me three times a year to hold a feast to me. Three times a year. They were to go up to where God had placed His name and they were going to go up and have a feast. Three times a year. God is a God of festivity. We get it in Exodus chapter 24. When the uh, covenant was ratified by blood, you know what you happen there, brethren? Or, or, or you know what you see happen there? You get Moses, you get Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and they go up on Mount Sinai with 70 priests. And you know what they do there? What do they do? They feast. They eat. They, it's just they, they eat with the Lord. They eat with God as the climax of the covenant. The covenant, the shedding of blood, it's inaugurated. The people say, yes, we will do that. And then they have a feast together. They eat together as the highlight of the covenant of the gathering. And then we get it in Matthew chapter 26. And what is Jesus doing there with His disciples? What are they doing before He goes to the cross? Is, what is He doing? Yes, they're eating. They're having a feast together. The Last Supper on the night that Jesus was going to be betrayed. He has a final meal with them. And he has his, 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 uh, his, his apostles are gathered around the table. And they're eating. And after the meal, brethren, Jesus takes the bread and says, this is my body. And he takes the wine and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. And they eat together. The climax of what Jesus is about to go and do. What an intimate moment that was. Remember, Judas was not there for that. God sent him out. And there he is, intimate with his disciples, eating and drinking with them, having a table spread before them. And the disciples eat with God in the flesh. Jesus, there he is, as the climax there, before he goes to the cross. And he commands them, remember? He commands them to feast. He says, do this in remembrance of Me. Brother, He tells them, now you go and feast. You go and eat. Open up with me to Psalm 23. We love this psalm. The Lord is My Shepherd. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. 
He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Verse 5, You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Bro, that's a picture of vindication. That's a picture of, of, of enemies looking on in defeat. The enemies, they are put to shame. And there's God. He spreads a table for His people. Vindicating them. Look at Psalm 78. Flip a couple chapters over here. Psalm 78. As we look at God preparing the table. Now, in Psalm 78, this is, this is a long psalm, and in the context here, uh, the psalmist is going over the sins of the people of Israel. Okay? God did all these good things for them, but they rebelled against Him. Okay? They rebelled. And, and look at verse 17. Psalm 78, starting in verse 17, is, says this, "...yet they sinned still more against Him, rebelling against the Most High in the desert." They tested God in their heart by demanding the food they craved. They spoke against God, saying, Can God spread a table in the wilderness? Brother, they doubted God's goodness. They put God to the test. Is God a good God? Can God... God, are you good? If you're good, Lord, you show me. Provide food for me. Brother, God is a good God. He just delivered them out of Egypt. He brought them through the Red Sea. They're in the wilderness. He's caring for them. He brought water out of the rock. And they spoke against God. Can God spread a table in the wilderness? <laughs> yeah. Yes, He can. Yes, yes, He can. Look down in verse 25. Or I guess verse 24. He rained down on them manna to eat and gave them the grain of heaven. Man ate the bread of the angels. He sent them food in abundance. Can God spread a table in the wilderness, brethren? Oh, He most certainly can. And this wouldn't be the last time that God would spread a table in the wilderness. We see Jesus doing this a number of times in the Gospels. Jesus. You got all these people. 15,000 people. 5,000 plus women and children. But 15 or 20,000. Tons of people, brethren. In a desert place. In a place of, 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 a, of, a, of a deserted area. A wilderness. And what do we see Jesus doing? Spreading a table. Providing food. For thousands of people. God is a God of the table. He is the host. God sent these people manna in the wilderness. Yes, He can. He can prepare a feast. Even in the desert. We see this also in Proverbs 9. You don't have to go there. But we see wisdom personified inviting the simple in. Come in and eat. I, I, have, I have a table spread of good food. Come and eat. Leave your simple ways behind. Come and learn wisdom. Come into my house and feast. See that in, 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 in Proverbs chapter 9. Feast and live. Now go, go over. I got uh, maybe one more here. Yes, one more. Go, go over to Isaiah. Back to Isaiah for the readings that we did in the Old Testament. 25. Go to Isaiah 25. Look at what the Lord says here. Isaiah 25, verse 6. It says, On this mountain, Yahweh of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. Brother, Yahweh prepares a feast. And He prepares His feast not just for Israel, but for all the peoples. For all of the nations. And in light of what happened in Isaiah 24, if you just look back, you see this. The judgment comes. And you see there in uh, verse 7, all the merry-hearted sigh. You see in verse 8, the mirth 
of the tambourines is silenced. No more music. The noise of the jubilant has ceased. No more festivity. Verse 9, no more do they drink wine with singing. No more. Every, verse 10, every house is shut up so that none can enter. The festivity ceases when God brings the judgment. And in light of that, brethren, He's going to spread a table. He's going to prepare a feast for all of the nations. And they're going to come, brethren, and they're going to come on this mountain. What mountain is that? Is he talking about here? What mountain is this? Zion, brethren. On Zion. He's going to prepare... Brother, this is a picture of salvation. It's a picture of what God's going to do in the Gospel. He's going to come and the nations are going to stream up into Zion to have a feast, to eat with the Lord God. And you know what He's going to give to us, brethren? Oh, I want you to see this. Brethren, in this feast, it's only the best that is offered to the nations. It's only the best. We will feast on the best. A feast of rich food. A feast of well-aged wine. Of rich food full of marrow. Anyone know what that means? Marrow? You know, I, I, what's that? Yeah, that's what I thought too. I, no, if you look up in the, in, in, in the Hebrew, it's the, it's the fat things, the, the fat portions. Now you might say, ew, that's gross. No, but listen to me. Hold on a second, okay? In the Bible, and, and, right, right, brother? That's the good stuff, right? <laughs> listen, in the Bible, the fat portions are the best part. Remember in the sacrifices? Whose portion was the fat portions? The Lord's. The best of the portion of the meat belong to the Lord. Brethren, He's going to spread a table for us of the best feast that our eyes can imagine. This is the picture here. This is a picture of what God is going to do in blessing the nations. Brethren, our God only brings out the best. And we saw that, if you recall, in John chapter 2. Remember what Jesus did? He brought out not just wine. What did the, what did the, 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 the host of the, of the wedding party say? This is the best wine. Oh, this is the good stuff. Brethren, our God only brings out the richest for us. He only brings out the best for His people. What a kind and generous God. Brethren, this is what Yahweh offers to the world through the Gospel through the Gospel that will truly, truly satisfy and bless all peoples if they would but just come to come. And isn't that what God says in Isaiah 55? Go to Isaiah 55 with me. More of this eating imagery. More of this inviting imagery. Isaiah 55, verses 1 and 2. Listen to this. Come. Isaiah 55, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Brethren, it's, it's free. You don't, you don't have money? You come, come and buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourself in rich food. Oh, brethren, why? Why would we spend our money on that which does not satisfy? Isn't that what the world's doing? Spending all the resources and chasing after idolatry, things that will never satisfy the soul. When we have Christ and He's here and He's saying, come, come to Me, come and eat, brethren. Come and eat of the bread of life. And those who eat of Christ will never hunger or thirst again. Satisfaction. That's the picture here. Come. Come. And at the Lord's table, brethren, the guests at His table, all of the peoples, without distinction, are invited to come. To come to His table. And He will gather all the nations around His table. And I'll tell you this, the Pharisees, they missed this. They missed it big time in the New Testament. They missed it. When Jesus comes on the scene, brethren, He challenges the ungodly practices of these leaders of Israel. Remember what they said of Jesus in Luke chapter 7? He says, John the Baptist came neither eating nor drinking, and they called Him a glutton. The Son of Man comes eating and drinking, and they say that He's a friend of tax collectors and sinners. You eat with tax collectors and sinners. They charged him against that. 
that he ate with the outcasts. He ate with those that were unclean. Actually, you know, I want to show you something. Go, go, go to that passage. Go to Luke real quick. Luke 7. This is a side note here, but a major theme in Luke's two-volume work, Luke and Acts, is eating. There are at least ten meals in Luke. There is a lot of eating. Jesus is around the table a lot in Luke. But look at what he says here in Luke 7. I found this interesting. Uh, in verse 33, John the Baptist came eating no bread and drinking no wine, and you say, he has a demon. Verse 34, the Son of Man has come eating and drinking, and you say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. Jesus says, yet wisdom will be justified by her children. And what's very interesting is that they accuse him of eating with sinners. And look at the next verse, verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked him to eat with him. So he went to the Pharisee's house and reclined at table. You eat with sinners. That's right, I'm going to eat at your house. Let's go. We're going to have a meal together. <laughs> of course, yep, that includes you, buddy. <laughs> right? I, I, I think it's kind of, kind of interesting there. But they missed this. The Pharisees would not sit at the table and share a meal with the blind, the crippled, the poor, the lame, those out of the outcasts of society. They wouldn't eat with them. And why is that, brethren? Well, who you eat with shows who your community is. Shows you who your people are. This is why little kids in middle school don't go and sit with strangers. They sit with their own little people. And they have their own little groups together. Okay? That's, that's their people. We don't eat with those people over there. They look weird. They dress weird. Or they talk weird. Or they're a different skin color than us. Or, 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 or what have you. Who you eat with shows who your community is, brethren. The Pharisees would not eat with these people. They would not eat with the outcasts of Israel. Why? Because it would make them ceremonially unclean. Brethren, when you eat with people, there is a bond. There is a unity. There is a oneness with each other. Because you eat and share the same food. You identify with those people. That's why they wouldn't do that. They would not eat with these outcasts, these people who are unworthy to enter the kingdom of God, so to speak. But Jesus, He eats with those who are unworthy. And it is through meals that Jesus sits at the table and cares for the poor and the needy. It's where He offers salvation to those outsiders. Those people come and they sit at table with Christ. And He's gentle with them and kind to them and ministers to them. And listen, brethren, the grace that we find in Christ, it is displayed as eating with Him. I mean, we we got we, we got to make these connections here, brother. We have been welcomed to the King's table. We find grace here that Jesus would invite us to come and to sit with Him. Unworthy sinners invited to come, come and sit with the King of Glory as He spreads a table, as He forgives our sins. We come and we dine with Him as we come and eat of the true bread that satisfies our soul, brethren. And we see this all over the Bible. And I talked about this a little bit in the Bible study. You get all these examples of this. The grace of God displayed when the unworthy come and eat with the King. You get it in Genesis 43 with Joseph. Joseph spreads a table for his unworthy brothers who sold him into slavery. They deserve death but He shows them grace and mercy and spreads a feast before them. We see it with Samuel, uh, or, or in Samuel, 2 Samuel chapter 10, we talked about this, David and Methibosheth. And what, and what do we see there, brethren? David's arch enemy's grandson, who's crippled in both feet. The cripple, right? He's poor and crippled, just like we see with Christ. And he, and he shows that covenant faithfulness, that, that, that loving tenderness, and brings Methibosheth to come and sit at the king's table. And it says there in Samuel that he ate at David's table like one of the king's sons. What a beautiful picture of the gospel and what Christ has done for us and, 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 and brought us into his table. You get it with Boaz in the book of Ruth. Talked about that. Boaz, or Boaz invites Ruth to come in to eat with him and he lays before her bread and wine. Picture of the Lord's Supper, certainly. She eats with her Redeemer. 
She's a Gentile. She's a Gentile, a Moabite. And we saw it there in Luke 14. The Father sends out the servants to invite those to the Son's banquet. Everything is ready. Everything is done. It's been accomplished. It is finished, Jesus said. All you do is come. You come by faith. You come clinging to the Savior. You come because He's invited you to come. And those Jews, they made excuses. But the poor, crippled, blind, and lame, these outcasts of Israel, they came. They came and there's still room. Oh, brethren, there's room for us there. There's a lot of room. And God's house will be filled. God's house will be filled. We've got to believe that. We've got to believe that. There's still, and you know what? There's still room. <laughs> Amen? There's still room to call the nations to come, to compel them, to urge them, to say, come, come, everything is ready. Why do you waste your money on that which will not satisfy? Come, delight yourself in rich food. Come, feed upon Christ, the bread of life, the true bread sent from heaven. Come and feed upon Him. That's the picture, brethren. Come and eat. It's a victory celebration. The King is conquered. Now listen, when we are devoted, when we're devoted to this, as, as God is the host, He sets the table. He spreads a table for unworthy sinners like you and I. And when we are devoted then, in turn, as, 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 as when God's grace comes flowing into us and then it flows out from us to the world, brethren, as we're devoted to the breaking of bread together, you know what this does? This displays the unifying power of the Gospel to the world. That's what it displays. When you are devoted to breaking bread with one another, when you're devoted to come and, 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 and eat at the fellowship meal, it's telling the world that we are a people united in Christ from all different walks of life. Because there's neither Jew nor, nor Gentile, slave nor free, black nor white, none of it. We are one people under a new head in Christ. And we display to the world that the Gospel unifies the people of God. The Gospel brings unity, brethren. It brings unity. And we see this all over the place. God has welcomed us to His table. Now we go out and we welcome one another. God has spread a table for us so that we spread a table to the least of these among us. God has provided us with rich food so that we go out and we provide the brethren with rich food. And that's why you ladies, when you guys cook, you guys cook your best. Of course you do. Why? Because you're an image bearer. Because you're, you're, an, you're made in the image of God. It's just innate in you. You want to do that. Why? Because God's done that for you. You see that. I want you to see and see, see more fully about what's going on as you, as you cook in your homes, as you, as you prepare meals here. We're walking in the, in the, in the ways of the Lord. Brethren, God has invited us to His table so that we invite others to our table. And I want to show you this. Look at the, how, the, how the Gospel unifies the people of God at the table. Look at Acts chapter 9 with me. Flip over to Acts 9. Acts 9. You get in verse 1. Look at this. But Saul, Acts 9 verse 1. But Saul, what's he doing? He's breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So there's Saul causing havoc upon God's people. And we know this. He, he's on the road to Damascus. God knocks him off his horse. He saves him, right? He sees the Lord. God saves him. He's blind. He, he's, verse 9, neither eating nor drinking three days. And then we get in verse 10. Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight. At, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he's praying. And he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. 
Okay, so here, so so you have the picture here. You got Saul. He's he's got authority to go and bind the Christians, bring them into jail, murder them, all kinds of things, wreaking havoc on the church. God saves him, and then God tells Ananias, Ananias, you got to go to go to that man Saul. And you, Ananias is like, uh, Lord, verse thirteen. Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. This is a wicked man, Lord. You want me to go to him? Lord, he, he has authority to bind people here. He's done a lot of evil. And the Lord tells him, he's a chosen servant of mine to bring my name before Gentiles and kings. So, okay, verse 17. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on on him he said, I love this, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. Now listen, here's the picture here. Saul, an enemy of God's people. God saves him. God sends Ananias to him. He's baptized. He, he, he rises and he takes food. Brethren, he takes food. Now listen, I would be, and I might, I might be reading into this a little bit, and maybe, maybe I am, but maybe I'm not. I don't think Ananias here gets him a fig bar on his way out. See ya. See ya, Paul. Have a nice day. I don't think he packs him a lunch and says, all right, bye. Brethren, they take food. They eat together. The, these were enemies. The enemies of God are with God's people. Now the enemies sit at the table and share food together. I mean, they got to come to the table here. They got to eat together. You see what I'm saying? I don't think he just gives them a snack and says, bye, see ya. Brethren, they come to the table. That's what the gospel does. It takes the enemies of one another and unites them. Oh, it unites them. At the table, taking food, he was strengthened. A taste of the kingdom, brethren, here on earth. People reconciled to God and then to one another. Next chapter, chapter 10, Peter and Cornelius. And we get here, Peter has this vision, right? He's up on the, he's up on the rooftop there. And in Acts chapter 10, uh, verse 13, Remember, he sees his sheep descending down and all these birds and reptiles, all, all kinds of these animals, and a voice, verse 13, came to him and said, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter says, By no means, Lord. I don't eat anything unclean. I don't eat that stuff. And the voice came to him again. What God has made clean, do not call common. Now, he's talking about the Gentiles here. Because God is going to cleanse the Gentiles by faith just like He does the Jews by faith. That's the whole purpose of the vision here. And then it says that it happened to Him three times. Now remember, as this is going on, there come some men sent from Cornelius, right? And they come to Peter's house. And God, and, and, and God tells them, Peter, you go down to them and you make no distinction. All right, so he goes down, and in verse 23, he invited the men in to be his guests. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here, and I'm going to assume, and I'm going to prove to you in a minute, but I'm going to assume here that they eat together. All right, because when you have a guest in your house, you probably feed them. That's, that's probably just natural to happen, right? Okay, but I'll show you in a minute. So, so then they come in. The people who were sent by Cornelius tell Peter, Cornelius had this vision, they, you know, come send for you to come tell him this message on how he's going to be saved. So Peter says, all right, well, all right, let's go. So then, look at verse, uh, where am I at here? Verse 48. So then, he goes to Cornelius' house. The Gentiles hear the good news. They are saved. The Spirit of God falls upon them. And then in verse 48, of chapter 10, the last verse, and Peter commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. So there's Peter, and he's with six other Jewish disciples, and they stay with these Gentiles, at, at, with Cornelius, for uh, uh, some days, for several days. Brethren, they're eating together. How, how do you know that? It doesn't say that. Well, look at chapter 11. Now the apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea 
heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcision party criticized him, saying what? What does it say? Verse 3. You went to uncircumcised men and ate with them. What are you doing, Peter? You don't eat with Gentiles. What's the matter with you? Peter goes... <laughs> And then he tells him the story, right? Bro, that's what the gospel does. The gospel unifies the people of God. When God saves, we find each other around the table, eating with one another, displaying to the world of the power of the gospel. And we see this in Acts 16. I got two more examples. And I'm almost done. Acts 16. You get it with Lydia. And we don't need to talk a lot about her, but Paul goes into Philippi. He's preaching to Lydia. Lydia gets saved. God opens up her heart to hear the things of Paul. And then look at what Lydia says in uh, uh, verse 15. After she was baptized, her and her household, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. Lydia is saved, and the first thing she wants to do, brethren, is display hospitality. Display hospitality to Paul and these disciples. Come, come and let, come eat with me. And maybe that's not here. Okay, fine. Then let's go to the Philippian jailer. Philippian jailer. Paul and Silas, brethren, they're in jail in Philippi. They've been beaten. They've been thrown in jail. They're singing hymns, midnight. And then God, remember, God sends that earthquake, shakes the whole place. The bars of the, of the, of the jail cell come off. The Philippian jailer goes to kill himself because he thinks all, the, all of the... Uh, all of the, uh, the prisoners have escaped, and Paul yells out, everyone's here, don't kill yourself. And you know what he says? Look at this. Verse 30, Acts 16. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Acts 16, 31. And the Lord said, or and they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of, Lord, of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them that same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. Then they brought them up into his house and set food before them. And he rejoiced along with his entire house so that he had believed in God. Now you know what drives me crazy? This text here is always fighting about baptism. And he's completely missed this here. Brethren, God saves this man... And what does he do? He's been a Christian for 30 seconds. And what does he want to do? He wants to eat with them. Come to my house and, and, and have a feast. Oh, we're, we are one in Christ. Come and eat. Because, I, because I'm overflowing with joy. I want to share a meal with you. Why? Because the kingdom of God is here on earth. And it's displayed around the table, brethren. Come and eat. He sets food before them. Brethren, that's what we see. The unifying power of the Gospel is displayed to the world as we eat with one another. As we sit around the table, neither Jew nor Gentile, slave or free, brethren, Philippian or apostle, one in Christ, gathered as a people of God from every tongue, tribe, people, and nation to eat. To eat. Brethren, that should encourage you. That should be an encouragement to you to say yes. And that's what I've been reading this week and saying yes. Yes, I'll, yes, yes. I, need, I want more of that. I, yes, I need to have a, a bigger understanding of the fellowship meal. What are we doing here? What is, what, what is going on that's, 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 that, that's bigger than what I'm realizing right here? We're not just coming together to eat. Yeah, we're doing that, but that's not the end of it. It's a picture of a larger reality of what is, of what is being displayed in the world about what Christ is doing among the nations, among, among the peoples, uniting us back to Himself and uniting us to one another. We have it displayed before us, brethren. Now listen, in your discipleship, okay, as disciples of Christ, myself, your pastors, and all of us together, in our discipleship, part of our discipleship, brethren, and part of your discipleship is to grow in this, to grow as a Christian, it, and to learn to show hospitality. To, to learn, brethren, to give as you have received. To do it. To spread a table. To gather the brethren in your homes to eat together. 
We're to grow in that. That's part of maturity of being a disciple of Christ. Is that as God has shown us hospitality, we go out and we do likewise toward one another. And listen, this is why in our discipleship group, what we do is we go from house to house to house to house to house. And part of that is to let the brethren have an opportunity to show hospitality to other brethren. That's part of the reason why we do that. So, so, so when we come in, I, and this is kind of an inside joke, but it's okay, I expect coffee and cookies. Okay? Amen, right? I expect that. And you know what? You wives, you, you deliver that. You deliver coffee and cookies or brownies, banana bread, fruit. I'll tell you what, I had some of the best fruit at the Steele's house. Oh, it was so good. I don't know, Michelle, we, well, you got those plums. But it was like, it was like you know, like, what's that psalm where the, the, when, when, when the brethren dwell together in unity, you got the, it's like, it's like the oil running down from Aaron's beard. Brethren, it was like that sweet plum juice just running down into my beard. All over. It was the best fruit I've ever had. It was, it was, it was, and, it was, and that's what we do. we do. We just gather around a little feast. And you know what? If you miss dinner, or sometimes these brothers are getting home late from work, they worked late, and they come in their uniform, and they haven't eaten dinner yet. And, and brother, yeah, have some dinner. Eat with us. Eat. Sit down and eat. We can take 20 minutes. Eat. And whenever I go to Michelle's house, she's always got good food. I'm always like, oh, I just ate. I'm, I'm so full. But Aaron, who's always ready for second dinner, comes in and he's like, oh, yeah, give me some of that. Like, you just ate 20 minutes ago, but he don't care. He's like a hobbit just waiting for the second meal, you know, and, and he wants it and, and, and he's ready for it. Brethren, but, but, but that's, that's where, that, well, you know, and that's, that, that, that's really small, but that's what we're just, we're just doing that, try, trying, to, trying to stir that up. To show hospitality so that we can come in and we sit and we eat together and we exhort one another around the table. And maybe, yes, it's just cookies and coffee, but the same principle is there, brethren. We're sharing together and we're gathered around the Word to encourage one another, pray together, warn one another, to speak the Word of Christ to one another. Brethren, we're seeking to show hospitality. That's what Paul commands us, all of us individually to do in, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 13. Seek to show hospitality. And our example is Christ. It's Christ. He's our example. Christ gathers us around His table, brethren. Christ sits with us, the least of these, and welcomes us into His, His family. And listen, we've got to grow here. I want to encourage you to grow. Because listen, and I've talked with Aaron and Nick about this before. Sometimes I, I go and see his brother where I struggle with this. I do, and I have all the excuses, just like some of you do too. My house is small, my AC is terrible, there's no room. I got all the excuses, brethren. I do. And I know you guys have the excuses too, but you know what? No, no, come, come. Who cares? If you come into my house and you're complaining it's too hot, well, that, the problem is on you, not me. That's, that's your problem, not mine. I'm trying. I got the fans, I got all kinds of fans, you know, I got the little AC thing. I'm trying to do th some things better. You know, and listen, some of you don't, you know, you guys, you don't have your own house yet or, 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 or you're sharing homes or whatever, got that going on here, or you live far away. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Bring the brethren in. Invite them. And again, I said this the other week, I'll say it again, I have never regretted it one time. Though, I, though I'm exhausted, though I'm tired, though this, that, and the other, I've never regretted it one time. Never, never once did I say that I was wasting my time. Ever, ever. And I know that goes on between some of you guys. And I want, you to, I want to see it grow. See the blessing here. See, 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 the, see the larger scope of what is going on here. Now I want to show you, this is the last thing I got, and then, and then we're going to close. Go to, go to Luke chapter 9. I want to show you an example of discipleship and hospitality. Luke, Luke 9. Just, just one, one example of this. Look at in uh, <clears throat> Luke 9. Starting in verse 1. And he called the twelve together and gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure all diseases. And he sent them out to proclaim the gospel of God and to heal. So Jesus is commissioning his disciples to go out on this mission. And he said to them, Take nothing for your journey, no staff, nor bag, nor bread, nor money, and do not have two tunics. And whatever house you enter, stay there and from there depart. And wherever they do not 
And wherever they do not receive you, when you leave that town, shake off the dust from your feet as a testimony against them. And they departed and went through all the villages, preaching the gospel and healing everywhere. Brethren, listen, Jesus tells them, don't take anything with you. Why? Because they got they to learn to rely on the hospitality of others. You got to go in there, you take nothing. You need to learn to trust the Lord. The Lord will provide for you, and He'll provide for you through the means of God's people. So you go and you trust the Lord, and you will be provided for. Okay? So that's, that's, that's point, lesson one of discipleship. And then, look at what happens here. Verse 10. On their return, the apostles told Him all that they had done, and He took them and withdrew apart, uh, withdrew apart to a town called Bethsaida. And when the crowd learned it, they followed Him, and He welcomed them. This is Jesus. And spoke to them of the kingdom of God and cured those who had need of healing. Now when the day began to wear away, the twelve came and said, Send the crowd away to go into the surrounding villages and the countryside to find lodging and get provisions. For we are here in a desolate place. But He said to them, Jesus, You give them something to eat. They said, We have no more than five loaves and two fish. Lest we were to go and buy food for all these people. For there are about 5,000 men, plus women and children. And he said to the, to the disciples, Have them sit down in groups of about 50 each. And they did so. And he had them all sit down. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing over them. Then he broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the crowd. And they, were all, and they all ate and were satisfied. And what was left over was picked up, about 12 baskets of broken pieces. Now listen, when the disciples went out, they lacked nothing. People provided for them. They trusted the Lord to care for their needs. But brethren, here, here, though they go, brethren, and they, and, they, and they preach, and they do all these good things, now they need to learn how to serve at the table. Brother, preaching's great. You're going to go out and preach. That's, that's great. But us, like the Lord Jesus Christ, we've got to learn how to serve at the table because Jesus is one who serves at the table. And they fail. And they fail. Jesus welcomed the crowds, but the disciples said, send them out of here. Send them home. Jesus says, you give them something to eat. <laughs> uh, Lord, there's like 5,000 people here. There's not enough to go around. Brethren, they need, to, they need to trust the Lord in both areas. And we need to trust the Lord in both areas to, to, be, to be given hospitality and to give it even when the means are slim. To trust the Lord. To learn to serve at the table just like the Lord Jesus Christ. It's got to go both ways, brethren. Now listen, many of us and many of you here have received much hospitality. And you've got to learn as you have received, now you've got to give even though your house isn't big, even though your, your AC is not that good, even though you, you might be tied on your budget. You've got to trust the Lord to provide. Lord, give us, give us this day our daily bread. Why? So you can share it with others. So you can share it with other people. And then to bring the brethren into the home. Brethren, I want you to hear the command here to seek to show hospitality, and I want you to do it and to live by it in light of the Gospel. I want you to look to Christ as the host and imitate Him. I want you to, to, to learn the, to, to trust the Lord to providing for you and then you providing for other people. I want you to see, brethren, the picture of the Gospel as, as, as brethren from radically different backgrounds come together as the people of God to eat with one another around the table. Brethren, let us be devoted to that. Let us be devoted to the fellowship meal. Let us see what we're doing is a taste of the kingdom of God. Let us be devoted to breaking bread in our homes with one another. Let us be devoted in displaying the, 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 the radical power of the gospel to the world. Let us be devoted, brethren, to welcoming and encouraging one another, trusting the Lord to provide. Let us, church, be devoted to the breaking of bread. Let's pray.